Next, we will consider a recommendation to adopt rules to enhance the custody controls that apply to investment advisors. Our goal when this process began was to strengthen the protections provided to investors who turn over their assets to investment advisors. I'm pleased that today's rules, if adopted, will help us achieve that goal. The rules we are considering grow out of the Madoff Ponzi scheme and many other frauds in which investor assets were misappropriated by advisors. Such frauds can cause investors to question whether their assets are safe when they entrust them to an investment advisor. I believe today's rules can help to put their minds at ease. Over the past several months, we have fine-tuned the rules to apply the safeguards where those safeguards are needed most, where the risk of fraud is heightened by the degree of control the advisor has over a client's assets. Most advisors today actually do not maintain physical custody of their client's assets. Instead, those assets are held by a qualified third-party custodian, such as a regulated bank or broker-dealer. In turn, that qualified custodian sends a quarterly account statement directly to the client who can see whether the account statement reflects the assets the client believes exist. Under such arrangements, particularly where an independent custodian holds client assets, the risk of client assets being misused is limited. But in several situations, there is a heightened opportunity for an advisor to misappropriate a client's assets and convert those assets to their own personal use. Today's rules will institute important new controls to guard against possible foul play in those situations. The first set of situations where there is a heightened potential for fraud involves the advisor who serves as the custodian and actually holds on to the client's assets, such as the Madoff firm did and the related situation where the custodian is affiliated with the advisor. In these cases, the heightened risk stems from the fact that the assets are not being held by a fully independent party who can serve as a check on fraud and misrepresentation. Under the new rules, these advisors, at least once each year, would be subject to a surprise exam by an independent auditor in order to verify client assets. If evidence reveals missing assets or material discrepancies during the surprise exam, the auditor is required to notify the SEC within one day. This will give the agency a direct line into potential frauds at an early stage. The surprise exam would not, however, be required if the advisor is deemed to be operationally independent of the affiliated custodian. That is where the advisor and the affiliate operate as distinct entities with no overlap of personnel, office space, or supervision. In addition to the surprise exam, all of these entities that actually hold client assets, be they advisors, affiliates, and even operationally independent affiliates, would have to undergo an annual review of the controls they have in place regarding custody. That review will have to be conducted by an independent accountant that is registered with and subject to regular inspection by the PCAOB. The surprise exam and the custody controls review will work to provide assurance that client assets, as reported to the client, exist and are properly held by a qualified custodian. It is my expectation that the new rules will encourage the use of fully independent custodians because these measures would not be required under such arrangements. And I encourage all advisors and their clients to consider that approach. The next situation where we are significantly enhancing safeguards involves advisors who have authority over their clients' assets. This occurs, for example, where an advisor serves as trustee to a trust has a power of attorney, or has the ability to write checks on a client's account, even though the advisor uses an independent custodian. Where the advisor has this significant level of control over client assets, there is a potential risk that the advisor could easily misappropriate funds. And the only check on the advisor's activity is for the clients to review and understand the statements they receive from the custodian and identify anomalies or debits that shouldn't be there. But unfortunately, these clients are often the very ones who, because of their own life circumstances, are not able to monitor their accounts or understand their account statements. They may be elderly, incapacitated, or frankly, too busy. 
In the last year alone, the Commission has considered several cases in which advisors allegedly stole money from client accounts, and the clients, many of whom were elderly, did not notice the money was missing. In one case, we allege the advisor drained $23 million from client accounts. In another, $6 million. No matter the size, it is a breach of trust for the investor who is relying on that investment advisor. For these advisors who have an enhanced ability to control their clients' assets, today's rules will require for them as well a surprise exam. These rules are designed to protect the very investors who need us the very most. When an advisor takes on the privilege and responsibility of having unfettered access to a client's money, particularly a client who is elderly, infirm, or who has compromised mental capacity, there is, I believe, the need to have an auditor's second set of eyes confirm that those assets are safe. However, we do acknowledge concerns raised by commenters regarding the impact of this new requirement on small advisors and their retail clients who may be more likely to enter into these types of arrangements. As a result, we're directing our staff to study the impact of these surprise exams on smaller advisors and their clients and report back to us following the first year of audits. We will use this study to assess whether modifications of the rule are necessary to improve its effectiveness or to reduce unnecessary burdens. Separate from the situation I just described is a situation where the advisor uses an independent custodian and merely has the ability to deduct fees from the client's accounts. This relatively limited form of custody has not to date presented the same opportunity for fraud and misappropriation as the situations for which we are enhancing additional controls. That is why the rules we are considering today would not mandate a surprise exam in these circumstances. Instead, the adopting release we're considering today will identify controls and procedures related to fee deduction that advisors should consider in order to assure that investor assets are appropriately protected. In addition, I have asked our examination staff to focus on fee deduction issues as they conduct investment advisor examinations. Today's rules will also impose an important new control on advisors to hedge funds and other private funds by requiring that any auditor that audits a private fund be registered with and subject to regular inspection by the PCAOB. I agree with commenters' assessments that the requirement to obtain a surprise exam and also have an annual audit of the hedge fund would largely be du duplicative. However, I believe PCAOB registration and inspection will serve as an important screening mechanism for these auditors. In addition, I strongly support the staff's efforts to continue to consider ways to enhance the custodial controls for private funds within our current jurisdictional framework. The new rules also require that the advisor reasonably believe that the client's custodian delivers the account statements directly to the client to provide greater assurance of the integrity of these account statements and so that clients can compare the account statement they receive from their advisor to determine that account transactions are proper. Importantly, we are also considering amendments to require additional public disclosure about the use of affiliated custodians and disclosure of the auditors performing surprise examinations so that the quality of custodial arrangements and controls can be better monitored. The new rules also require auditors to explain the basis for the ending of their service to an advisor. This so-called noisy withdrawal can serve as a red flag for our staff and for the advisor's clients. In addition, today we'll consider issuance of an interpretive release updating 1960s era guidance on conducting surprise exams as well as guidance on the internal controls report. I'm committed to adopting effective and meaningful rules to protect client assets and I'm committed to doing so based on what I believe to be in the very best interests of investors. Today's package of rule adoptions represents a significant strengthening of our custody controls and an important step in reassuring investors that the regulatory system will be there to protect them. For now, I'll turn the meeting over to Buddy Donahue, Director of the Division of Investment Management, to hear more specifically 
about the division's recommendations. Before I do that, I want to thank those who have worked tirelessly, and I suspect right through the night last night, with Buddy to prepare the recommendation before us today. Bob Plays, Sarah Bissin, Dan Call, Melissa Roberts, Vivian Liu, Rick Sennett, Brian Morris, and Jamie Eichen in the Division of Investment Management, Paul Beswick in the Office of the Chief Accountant, Jill Felker, Lori Price, Jeff Singh Dawson, and Meredith Mitchell in the Office of the General Counsel, Jean Golke in the Office of Compliance, Inspections, and Examinations, and Chuck Dale, Woodrow Johnson, and Adam Glass from the Division of Risk, Strategy, and Financial Innovation. Thank you all for your hard work. Buddy? <laughs>